In 2013, the English Football Association celebrated its 150th year and the national team qualified for their 14th FIFA World Cup. Despite their disappointments, England remains one of the oldest and proudest football nations. When you stood in line waiting to represent your country and you've got your 10 teammates alongside you and you've got that England shirt on, whether you're at home and it's at Wembley and it's bouncing around and, and the noise is going through the roof with people singing it or whether you're playing in a country away and you're getting whistled and you can barely hear it, it means so much every time. As the birthplace of the commercial steam engine, England can be regarded as the cradle of the modern industrial world. It is the country which also invented the corkscrew, the mass-produced toothbrush, the postage stamp and the lawnmower. In 1954, English medical student Roger Bannister became the first person to run a mile in under four minutes. And the fastest crossing of a tightrope by a dog was recorded by Ozzy, a crossbreed from Norwich, who negotiated a 3.5 metre rope in 18.22 seconds. English people consume more tea per capita than any other country. And the largest ever collection of vacuum cleaners was claimed by Englishman James Brown, who had 322 different models. The England football team played the world's first international in 1872, drawing nil-nil with their neighbours Scotland. And in 1888, England formed the world's first football league. Notable clubs include Manchester United, Manchester City, Chelsea and Liverpool. And the national team's nickname is the Three Lions. England did not compete at the FIFA World Cup until 1950. The tournament in Brazil was an unhappy one for them. Already humiliated by the USA, England also lost their final group match against Spain and returned home with plenty to think about. Despite quarter-final appearances in 1954 and in Chile in 1962, English victories at the tournament were few in number. However, in 1966 they were the hosts and won a thrilling final against West Germany, during which Jeff Hurst scored three times. He remains the only player to have achieved this feat. I'm often asked the question, what were the emotions after the whistle went at the end of the game? And my first emotion was a sense of relief that we got through. The enjoyment of winning a World Cup lasts forever. Um, it, lasts, it just lasts forever because everybody reminds you of it. Their best performance since that victory came in Italy in 1990, when they reached the semi-finals. Four years later, they failed to qualify, but one Englishman who was present at the tournament in the USA was Roy Hodgson, who coached the Swiss team. Hodgson is now in charge of his home country, which has failed to make a significant impact at the FIFA World Cup since 1990. There's no doubt that uh, in recent years in particular, we are to some extent burdened by the fact that our league is an unbelievably intensive one and there is literally no let-up from the 12th or 15th of August right through to the 15th of May. So I think that we're always going to be fighting against that. Um, that's not purely an English problem. That, you know, I think there'll be other European countries maybe saying uh, the same thing. Hodgson's squad includes a number of young players chosen at the expense of some established names who helped the team through qualifying. None of them have played for a club outside Great Britain, and while the high-speed domestic league has attracted some of the world's best footballers, it has been suggested that English insularity and the influx of foreigners have been detrimental to the national side. It's an easy one to say, you know, if you look at it black and white, you know, we've po possibly not produced as much uh, good English talent as we have done in the, in the past, but that may be nothing to do with the amount of foreign, foreign talent, or it, or it may be, it's, it's a, you know, no one really knows. But for me, the Premier League's the, the, the best league to play in, it's the best league to watch, and there's a lot of foreign players playing in it. Although unbeaten in their qualifying campaign, England's path to Brazil was not straightforward. Drawn in a tricky group, they began in fine style away in Chisinau. That was an important result because, you know, Moldova shows like we scored nine goals against Moldova, but they didn't concede that many. In actual fact, uh, more than 60, 70% of the goals they conceded, we got. 
And that 5 0 win actually got us off to got us off to a good start. It was always going to be tough with the with the fixtures that we got. Um, you know, some tough teams, some teams that are, are gaining a lot of confidence um, over the last few years and putting in some fantastic performances. So it was always going to be difficult, but in the end, we got the draws and we needed to get the draws. A point was secured in a hostile environment in Montenegro. And another was rescued by Frank Lampard's late penalty at home to Ukraine, who proved to be their closest rivals. The key return match in Kiev also ended in stalemate. I think Ukraine away was important for us. Um, I think obviously, ideally, we'd have liked to go there and win that game, but um, with the situation, it was a really good point. Um, you know, they were very confident going into the game. We knew how dangerous they were, and they are as a team. When the, the numbers were added up and we realised, obviously, we needed the two wins in the last two games, it, it sort of um, focused your mind on what you needed to achieve, and thankfully, um, we scored some good goals in those games and, and managed to get the wins. England's penultimate match was at home to Montenegro. Hodgson's bold decision to give Andros Townsend his debut paid off, as England scored four, leaving them one win from securing their place in Brazil. When the last two games came about at Wembley, it, there couldn't have been a better place to play football. And the fans got you know, right behind us and you know, spurred us on to, to good performances. Qualification was secured against Poland at a raucous Wembley Stadium. England's two senior players saw them across the finish line. Wayne Rooney's first half header was followed by Steven Gerrard's late toe poke. Gerrard and Rooney were the key players, without a shadow of a doubt. They were the, they were the two players throughout the ten games who played the bulk of the games and you know took the bulk of the responsibility. Wayne, especially towards the end when he was playing so well in the beginning, uh, he, he did a fantastic job without maybe hitting the heights that he hit towards the end of the ten games. But it, it was a, a tough, a tough period for us. This year is likely to be the final appearance at a FIFA World Cup for the captain Steven Gerrard, who's made over a hundred appearances for his country. Gerrard has often been the inspiration for the England team. I don't think there could be a better captain than him. Helps the young players out, um, speaks to me a lot. Um, he's, he's respected and, and that's another thing that, that a captain's got to have. And, he, and he, he goes about the business and sets an example on the pitch and, and that's what, what the players love and, and we're behind him 100%. This will be the first FIFA World Cup campaign since 1998 in which the team will be led by an English coach. Hodgson took over in 2012 and guided the team at that year's European Championship. He loves being the England uh, manager and that's, that's something that comes across really well, not only to us but to everyone in the nation. So I say he's a fantastic coach, generally a really nice guy and when um, you come together for these meetups, you want to do well for each other but also you want to do really well for the manager as well. I've always tried to be a good coach and Good, what good coaches try to do, they try and coach their team so the players are well prepared and the players know how to defend and how to attack. So I'm afraid my philosophy isn't, uh, doesn't contain any magic or mystery. It's just a question of trying to make certain that when a team goes on the field, it knows what it's got to do defensively and it knows what it's got to do offensively. And to be a good attacking coach, you need good attacking players. And if you don't have those at your disposal, then Unfortunately, you will never be given the, uh, the title of a, a great attacking coach. Like a number of coaches, Hodgson used several formations in qualifying, but Joe Hart will certainly be in goal if he's fit. Hart played in every qualifier, and despite a dip in form for his club last season, he is the England number one. In front of him, expect a very different back four to that seen in South Africa with Jagielka and Gary Cahill in the centre, and Leighton Baines now preferred to Ashley Cole on the left. We're in, a, in, in many respects, I would say, in a state of transition. We've got uh, one or two of the old guard are going, and my strong view is we've got half a dozen players now that are capable of making a name for themselves in the national team. 
when the manager generally comes in and takes over a team, the first thing he wants to do is, is get his defensive philosophy sorted because obviously if you don't concede goals, you don't lose games. That's the most important thing. In midfield, the linchpin is Gerrard, who's likely to be joined by younger legs. But the experienced Milner is a safe option on the right. Rooney may form part of a five-man midfield behind a striker who will almost certainly be either Danny Welbeck or Sturridge. We know what a good group of players we've got here. We've got a great mix of youth and, and experience as well. And, and he wants us to go out there and, and show our ability with the ball, um, but also do that dirty side of the game as well, where you've got to track and work for each other and, and press and win that ball back high. The English will have more interest than most in the goal line technology introduced to the FIFA World Cup this year. They have been involved in two of the best examples of why the system is being used. They benefited in the 1966 final, but felt aggrieved in South Africa. Both matches were against their old rivals from Germany. There are three former champions in Group D. England face Uruguay and the lowest ranked nation in the group, Costa Rica. They kick off their campaign against Italy in Manaus. Manaus is the capital city of the state of Amazonas. Between June and November, temperatures may reach as high as 40 degrees centigrade in the city. Four group matches will be played here, including England's game against Italy on the 14th of June. Much will depend on that opening match for both Italy and England, who face Uruguay five days later in Sao Paulo and conclude the group stage in Belo Horizonte on June the 24th against Costa Rica. I think World Cups are always things that will last in people's memories when they were a kid because of what it, what it kind of embodies. It embodies, you know, everyone in the world becoming a family and it being a big party in whatever country it is and, and everybody embracing each other. I think you could put a World Cup on the moon, it'd, they'd have the, an amazing atmosphere, but the fact that it's in Brazil as well and 24 hours a day there, you know, they love football. It's, it's middle of the night and people are on the beach playing head tennis on the volleyball nets or they're playing beach soccer and people doing kick-ups at the side of the road. And just the love for the game out there is unreal. We're quite confident that we've got a team, um, you know, all going, pulling in the right direction now, so... I'm not going to sit here and, and start, you know, guaranteeing us getting to quarterfinals and semi-finals, but it, it'd be nice, obviously, to, to, to be reaching those sort of stages and putting ourselves in the hat and just seeing how far we could go.